Good morning. Have you ever considered how much impact the key relationships around you are having on your life? Have you ever thought about how much they're shaping your value? They influence the way you think. They uh, cause you to think things differently or to see things differently. Let me give you a couple of examples. How would your life be different if Dave Ramsey was your best friend? You know, Dave Ramsey's known around the world for personal finance and management and budget and zero, all that kind of stuff. How would your life be different if he was your best friend? Or how would your life be different if Elon Musk was your best friend? You might be doing some traveling. You'd probably be driving a Tesla. You know, your life would probably be a little bit different. There's an uh, NBA basketball player who is uh, just really rising to uh, the top of a lot of statistics, but he has a friend who constantly keeps getting him into trouble. The NBA basketball player's name is Ja Morant. And so he has a friend who loves to go to nightclubs and have Ja go with him and for Ja to flash a gun, and then the friend take videos and pictures and post it on social media. So last year he cost Ja about eight games already for next season. He's been... Um, banned from 25 games, and with that, he had lost tens of millions of dollars because he had a friend who is probably not influencing him in the best way. How would your life be different if your best friend was an incredibly healthy eating fanatic? I know, clearly you can tell that's not my best friend. Okay, my best friend loved desserts and ice cream, and all those good things that uh, my doctor keeps telling me I need to get away from. But the truth of the matter is, our friends shape us probably far more than we recognize. So what would it look like if you had a couple of key relationships that you intentionally said, I want this to be a relationship that shapes me spiritually. I want this to be a relationship that defines how I pursue God. I want it to be a relationship that intentionally has full access to my heart, my soul, everything in me. They have permission to speak to me about any of those things and bring out the best in me. Would your life be different if you purposely put those kind of relationships in your life? I don't know if you heard about the time when the, uh, the first president, George Bush, was uh, traveling with his wife, Barbara, and they were taking a private road trip, and uh, as they drove along, they needed some more fuel, and so George pulled over into a gas station. Uh, the attendant came out very happy and immediately began to uh, put fuel into the car. Barbara jumped out of the car, ecstatic, ran over, talked to the gas station attendant, was really animated, smiling, laughing, and just seemed to really be enjoying herself. And when he got all done, just before she got back in the car, she reached over and just gave him a big hug. And then she quietly just goes calmly and sits back in the car, and George said, well, what was that all about? And she goes, oh, that's a former boyfriend of mine. We dated back in high school. <laughs> and so George thought he would be clever, and he said, just imagine, if you had stayed with him, you'd be married to a gas station attendant. And she said, oh, no, no. If I'd married him, he'd be president. <laughs> so apparently, who you hang out with and who you associate with does affect how you uh, live your life. In fact, it's so important that 58 times in the New Testament, between Matthew and Revelation, 58 times there's what we call one another passages. And so they're passages that say things like encourage one another, bear one another's burden, pray for one another, encourage one another, spur one another on to love and to good deeds. And the reason why, because God understands that real clearly you and I grow best in the context of relationships. So can I have a faith in Jesus Christ all by myself? Yes, will that be me and my faith at my best? Absolutely not. God has created us and wired us for relationships and he understands that we are at our best in relationships. If you think about it, going clear back to Genesis, it was God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit who created us so we're created by a trinity that is always in relationship. So when it says that we're created in the image of God, part of what that means is 
we're creative, we're wired, we are at our best when we are in the context of relationships. At the same token, if you grew up in the church, your parents probably told you that you can be impacted and be at your worst if you're in the wrong relationships. In fact, your parents may have uh, quoted for you at some point, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, it says this, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. You know, your, my parents would always want to know who my friends were, and they'd want to know what family they were from. They'd want to know what kind of thing they're into and what they're not into. And my parents were always looking out for, am I going to begin to associate myself with somebody who's going to affect my character in a negative way? In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, it says it this way. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You see, our parents knew that who we spent time with, who we listened to, who we talked to, would shape our values, our character, and our actions. But at the same time, God also knows that. And God has cared deeply about relationship. God has never desired for us to try to have a faith relationship with him independent of everybody else. There is a subtle thing that happens in America and in Western cultures that doesn't happen in other parts of the world. And that is this. We've taken our Bill of Rights that said, I have certain unalienable rights as an individual. And we've said, as a faith follower, as a follower of Jesus, I am an individual with my own rights. And yet God has never intended that. God has always worked through families, worked through nations, worked through tribes, because God has always understood that we are at our best, especially when it comes to pursuing him in the context of relationships. One of the places where I saw that play out in a way that just really caught me off guard was uh, there was this little thing a couple years back, uh, you may have heard about it here, uh, called COVID. And one of the things that happened in that, you may have seen this, but there were some different opinions about masks. I don't know if you noticed that, okay, or if you saw that in the news or read anything, but there were different people that had different ideas and values and thoughts and attitudes about masks. And so one day uh, I was doing lunch with uh, one of the guys from our global department when I was still in uh, Arizona. And so I just asked him, I said, so hey, what's happening in some of the other countries that we're doing work in when it comes to masks and COVID, what's their reaction to it? And he goes, it's just radically different. It's not an issue. In some of the cultures that we're dealing with, it's not an issue. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, because they're community-based. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, in America, the challenge that we're having with masks is you can't make me wear a mask. I don't want to wear a mask. If I don't want to wear a mask, I don't have to wear a mask. And he said, yeah, in other cultures, the idea was this. If it is better for others, why would I not wear a mask? And so they're not fighting it because they're not giving something up of themselves. They're giving something to their culture. Now, I'm not giving a pro or a con on a mask. I'm simply trying to make this difference. We have taken that individuality that we live in in America and taken that about our faith. So our prayer time is private. My, my beliefs about certain things about God, my finances are private. Where, how I'm doing spiritually is private. What I'm struggling with in my sin life is private. And yet what God has always intended was that those would be things in a community. Why? Because in the context of that community, I have support. I have encouragement. I have help. I have wisdom. I have strength. Everything benefits me and my faith relationship in the context of community. In fact, God has quite a bit to say about this. In uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25, he says this. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Even in that one passage, you see a couple of those uh, one another, because the idea is you will do better in your faith in the context of community. 
you will encourage one another, you will spur one another on to love and to good deeds. Again, in Ephesians chapter 4, it says it this way. Then we will no longer be infant, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Listen to this. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Did you catch in the middle of that passage that learning to speak and hear the truth and love is a part of God's plan for you and I to mature in our faith? That's not something I can do by myself. That's not something I can do as an individual. That's something I do by being in key, trusted relationship. That's something that happened because I've said to certain people, you have full access to everything in my life. Speak to me about anything you see. I trust you enough that if you say something that's hard for me to hear, if you say something that's hurtful to me, I'll know you're loving me as you do that, and I will take that into consideration. I need that. There are some times where you and I would be much better served by somebody hurting our feelings than patting us on the back. And we can take that when it's in the context of a loving relationship. We can take that when it's in the context of a relationship that we have built, in relationships where we've shared with each other, where we've given each other permissions, where we've been transparent, authentic, and real with each other, rather than in the context of a relationship that says, I'm on my own, leave me alone. I don't want you to know about where I am spiritually. I don't want to ask you questions. I don't want you to challenge me, question me, spur me, or anything else. I just want to be left alone to live my faith by myself. Years ago, uh, the first Paul that I ever had in my life, we'll talk about Paul's in just a minute, the first Paul I ever had in my life was a man who was about 13 years older than me, I was in my uh, late 20s at the time when we met, and he just uh, took me on. And he just said, hey, I would love to get together and just start meeting with you and mentor you. And I just said, that'd be awesome. I'd never had somebody mentor me. In fact, I'd grown up in the church. I never rebelled. I never went through a high school phase. And so everybody in my home church just said, Tommy, doing fine. Just leave him alone. But here was a man who looked at me and said, this guy could be so much more than he is right now. If somebody would invest in him, if somebody would pour life into him, challenge him, spur him, and uh, just uh, coach him along. And so he did. He poured into me. And uh, some of the most powerful spiritual lessons I have in my life, I learned from him. And I have been forever changed because of my relationship with him. After several years of uh, doing ministry together and just a, a good friendship and a good mentoring and coaching from him, uh, there came a time where I moved about 500 miles away. And about six months later, I got a call from his boss, from his supervisor. He was a uh, Christian counselor. And uh, his boss called me and just said, hey, I need to talk to you. Uh, your friend is, um, is in an inappropriate relationship with a married client. And I need to have a conversation with him. I'm going to talk to him about that. I'm going to confront him. I'm going to talk about what that's doing to his practice, what that's doing to his ministry, how that impacts us as the church, and how it's impacting his relationship with God. And he goes, it's going to be a really difficult conversation. He could probably use a really good friend in the room. And I know he just had the, the utmost respect for you. Is there any chance that you'd be willing to be here? I said, absolutely. Let me know. And when? And he, it was going to be the next week. So I got on the phone and booked a flight. And I went 500 miles and uh, got a ride to, from the airport to uh, my hometown. And then uh, that next week, I sat in an office. And this supervisor went through everything with my friend and just talked about the absolute chaos and devastation that his actions were causing. I got to tell you, I was sitting there as uh, somebody in their 20s, and I was a nervous wreck. Uh, I was just imagining my friend's reaction. I was imagining how hurt he would be, upset. Uh, this may be the last time I see him. I just, everything inside of me was just uh, a wreck. Uh, I hate confrontation. 
Uh, I've learned the value of them in a healthy way, but I have never liked them. And I remember when we were all said and done, and uh, it was Glenn's turn to talk, and I thought, here it comes. And he looked at us and he said, uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you. I have never been loved more than I would just love by the two of you. That conversation took place over 30 years ago, and I've never forgotten. I could tell you the room. I could tell you everything about that conversation. But most of all, what I can tell you is this. Because there is a person who is willing to hear the truth spoken in love, there was a deep repentance and growth that took place in his life. But the benefit that he got from that would have never happened if there weren't two people willing to say, I'm going to love him enough to risk his friendship and share something with him that he needs to hear. And I am thankful for uh, Glenn and his response, and I'm thankful for Don and for his willingness to have that tough conversation. But I got to tell you, many Christians are not good at speaking the truth in love. And many Christians are not good at hearing the truth in love. And so let's just talk about that for just a minute. I want to just park right here for a minute. When it comes to speaking the truth in love, it can't be out of the fact that I'm disgusted by what you've done. It can't be out of the fact that I need to get this off my chest. You need to know where I stand. You need to be called out. It can't be out of something that starts with me. If it starts with me towards you, that's not love towards you. That's love towards me. I'm caring enough about me and my frustration or my feeling or emotions about it that I'm willing to unload on you. That's not speaking the truth in love. When it comes to speaking the truth in love, there's a couple of key things to look at. Is the other person going to benefit from this? Am I doing this from a heart of humility? Have I spent a significant amount of time praying and wrestling about this? Have I prayed and said, God, help my heart to be right? Help my word to be yours. Help his or her heart to be right. And let their reaction be one that draws them closer to you, not one that pushes them away from you or reacts to me. You see, speaking the truth in love always had the benefit of the other person as the priority, not what's going on inside of me as a priority. So let me give you a, a tip when it comes to speaking the truth in love. And I learned this from my uh, oldest son. When uh, my oldest son was uh, young, when he was a little kid, he was not very good at hearing the word no. Okay, keep your elbow to yourself, look up here, okay? When he was young, he didn't like hearing the word no. And whenever we would say no to anything, even if it was a small request, it was like a meltdown, okay, happened. And it was like, all you wanted was to stay up an extra 10 minutes. It's not worth that reaction, but there would be a meltdown. And then all of a sudden, I started noticing that he was doing something different. And I don't know where he got the idea. I'm just grateful that he got the idea. But he would start approaching things, and he would say, you know, Dad or Mom, um, it's okay if you say no, but I was wondering if, if I could go to so-and-so's house after school tomorrow. And here's what I noticed. I noticed one in me, I noticed, man, I wanted to say yes because his attitude was right. Now, sometimes I still had to say no because what he was asking for was just not a why thing or wasn't appropriate or wouldn't have, couldn't happen on that day. So there were still times I said no. But the biggest thing I noticed was what changed inside of him and that was, he was able to hear no when he prefaced it that way and not react to it. It was almost like he was telling himself, hey, be ready, you could get a no for this one. But it helped him to have the, heart, the right heart in asking me. So here's what I want to suggest. What if you and I learn how to speak the truth in love well? So for instance, what if we started it with a comment like this, Robert, I hope you know that I just love you deeply. I cherish who you are. I have so much respect for you. But there's something I see in your life that I feel like I need to share with you. So I'm just going to share it, and then I'm going to ask you to consider that between you and God. And then just share what needs to be shared and leave it alone. He's not accountable to me. He doesn't have to do what I say. He doesn't have to report back to me. 
I was just trying to give him the gift of sharing something that I think he needs to know. And it may be something he's blind to. It may be something that he got himself caught up in. It may be something that he's not even aware of that he's doing it. But what if we just learned to phrase it in a way that it made it easier for him to hear it? Or maybe if we're on the receiving end of it, what we would do is we would say something like, you know what, I know you care about me, and I know you want nothing but for the best for me. So it was really hard for me to hear what you just said, but, but I'm going to take that into consideration, and I'm going to spend some time thinking about that. Now, I don't have to say in the moment that, yeah, I totally agree with you, because I may not be there yet. I may need to just kind of wrestle with that one, but what if doing that told me, Tom, don't react to what they just said. Think enough about that relationship to go, okay, I just need to spend some time wrestling with that, and then I need to let God convict me of that, or I need to let God tell me, Tom, that's okay, it's a misunderstanding. So here's what I want to challenge you with. What if you and I were better if we learned to communicate graciously and listen humbly? How could it affect our relationship if you and I learned to communicate graciously and to listen humbly? So today I want to talk to you about three key relationships, and I encourage you to uh, seek these out. I encourage you to invite these. I encourage you to recognize them if you already have them in your life. But uh, let's just jump in, and I'm going to start first off with a Paul. I think everybody in here benefits from having a Paul. So let me describe a Paul to you. Uh, obviously, I'm using Paul from the Apostle Paul. But here's what a Paul is. A Paul is a coach. A Paul is, is a, someone who calls you up. A, a Paul is someone who says, you could do this. I've seen you do this, this, and this. You've got this in you. A Paul sees more in you than you see in yourself. A Paul builds your confidence because they have confidence in who you are. A Paul is always inspiring you. They make you better. When you walk away from spending time with a Paul in your life, you just go, man, that is so good for me. Every time I'm with that person, I, I win. I gain from that. I grow from that. I benefit from that. That person is a blessing in my life, and I am grateful for them. One of the common words we would use today is, is a Paul is a mentor in your life. And sometimes they invite themselves into our lives, and sometimes we invite them into our lives. But I want to encourage you and ask you to think about, do you have a Paul or more do you have some Pauls in your life? These are people that you've given permission to say, look, you can say anything you want to me about anything because I trust you that much. And here's the other thing. I'm asking you to be a Paul in my life because I want to get better. I, I am confident that you see things in me that I don't see in myself. And I, I would benefit from that. So would you be willing to invest in me and be a Paul in my life? I can tell you that I've had uh, several Pauls, and they have radically shaped who I am today. And in every situation, the Pauls in my life have made me better. I, I have won by allowing them to be a Paul in my life and by God bringing them into my life. So I shared one earlier, which is Glenn Zog. Another one is a David Hopper, and he just invested in me, uh, just seeing myself more through the lens of how God sees me than how I see myself. And that was a deep rich truth for me that, that transformed me. And another one is Kelly O'Donnell. Kelly O'Donnell is a walking Paul. She, she does not know how to have a conversation with somebody that she's not investing in them. She just sees in other people, want for other people, and is constantly investing in other people. She has taught me a ton, and I am grateful uh, for her investment in my life. Uh, my wife, Alana, has had Pauls all the way from uh, high school, uh, Penny Blanchard with a Paul in her life. Uh, in college, Muriel French with a Paul in her life. Uh, early in our marriage, Sandra Perdue with a Paul in her life. She has benefited from those relationships, and I have benefited from those relationships. So I want to encourage you that you need to have a Paul in your life, and you need to be a Paul in your life to somebody else. So I want to ask you to do something real quick. Think of, if you have a Paul in your life right now, would you just commit to writing them a letter, emailing them, texting them, calling them, and just thanking them for the investment that they make in your life? 
If you don't have a Paul in your life, I want you just to think, who do you need to ask? Would you be a Paul in my life? Here's the deal. A Paul just needs to be one step further than you are. They don't need to have all the answers. They don't need to be perfect. They don't need to have everything figured out. They just need to be one step further. One step further than you when it comes to leadership or marriage or finances or your spiritual life or prayer or Bible study. You need to look around though and just say, who's the person who's a step ahead of me who could teach me and help bring me along, okay? The second relationship that every single one of us need to have is a, a Barnabas. And you need uh, several Barnabases in your life. I need several Barnabases in my life. I have been blessed. I'm surrounded by them, but I will always take more. Uh, a Barnabas is a teammate. They walk alongside of you. They encourage you. They affirm you. They counsel you. They dream with you. They partner with you. They just hear you out. They don't judge you. That, that Barnabas is just somebody that you go, man, on my worst day, I can just go vomit all over them, and they're just going to go, okay. Now, let's pray about that. Let's get back to life. But I'm not going to feel judged for just being down in that moment or just, ah, I just feel like I, I just got to unload. I got to vent. Other times, uh, man, they just come alongside and they pat you on the back and they go, oh, dude, you are doing far more than you realize. You're, you are doing better in this. And you're, man, I remember three years ago when you would do that. Look at you now. They're just a source of constant encouragement. In Acts chapter 4, verse 36, listen to this. It said, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Wouldn't that be awesome if in God's word, your name was mentioned and what was said about you is, oh, everybody who knows him, he's an encourager. She's an encourager. If you talk to her, you're going to walk away encouraged. Isn't that a powerful statement? Wouldn't you love that anytime somebody knows they're going to spend time with you, they just kind of pick up in their spirit because it's always going to be good. It's always going to be positive. They are always for me. They are never against me. They are for me. They have my back. Again, I can name um, some uh, Barnabas that I've had in my life for over 20 years. Uh, I can share a couple of weeks ago, that, uh, one of my Barnabas was here, uh, Mark, who flew out here from Arizona. Not because there was anything here he needed to see, he needed to see where I live. He needed to see where I'm doing church. He needed to, to meet you so that he would know how to pray for me, how to encourage me, how to help me believe in what God's plans are that would be bigger than my plans. Mark came out here because he's my Barnabas. Mark didn't come out here because he needed to come out here. He came out here because he knew that the best way to be a Barnabas to me was to know what's going on in my life, what's going on in my world. Who the Barnabas in your life? Now, here's another thing I'll share with you with Mark. Uh, a little over 20 years ago, we started meeting, uh, me and about three other guys, and, and I was the Paul, they were the Timothys. And Mark at the time was doing something else, and I just kept telling him, you need to be in ministry. And he had all the reasons why he shouldn't. And finally, one day, uh, a church called him and said, uh, hey, we, we have a position for you. And he took it, and he's a pastor in a church of uh, several thousand people, and God just uses him in some really powerful ways. Now we're Barnabases, okay? So your relationship can change with people over the years as they mature, as you mature, as different things happen. But I will tell you, my life is better because I spend time with Mark. Uh, we used to live in the same side of the valley. I moved to the other side of the valley. And uh, once a month or once every six weeks, Mark would drive an hour to come spend the morning with me. And that was his day off. But it's just because we knew there was a richness. We knew both of us won from having that Barnabas relationship. We know things about each other that uh, I don't know if anybody else knows. But there's just that kind of an openness uh, and a transparency. I look forward to every time I get to be with Mark. There are times where I'll call him from here and we'll just spend two hours on the phone. Alana will tell you I don't spend 10 minutes on the phone with her, but for Mark, I'll talk for a couple of hours. Don't tell her that. But it's just that thing of I need that. He needs that. And so we benefit from that. Another one I have is uh, Roger Ellis. Uh, and over 40 years of ministry, Roger gets ministry better than anybody else I've ever worked with. 
And he has taught me things about ministry. He believed in me and encourages me. Uh, about 10 years ago, he moved to Texas. We still call each other from time to time and just go, hey, what am I missing on this one? What, what would you do or what could I do to do better at this? What am I blind on on this? What am I not seeing? That kind of, we, we still are Barnabas, even though we're separated by you know, hundreds of miles. For Alana, some of the people who have been a Barnabas in her life are Kelly O'Donnell and then a couple of gals, uh, Kim Allen and Christian Bain. They have met together consistently for over 17 years. And sometimes they'll do a book study together and they're going to read a book on prayer or they're going to read a book on Bible study or uh, on marriage or whatever. And sometimes they use that as kind of a launching board for what they're going to talk about. Other times they get together with no agenda other than to love each other. And uh, those three ladies know that any time any one of them needs, the others would be on the plane and they would be there immediately because there's that kind of a relationship. The last one I want to talk to you about is the Timothy. You need a Timothy in your life, and you need to be a Timothy. And to be real honest, you probably need more Timothys in your life than one. So before I describe a Timothy, let me explain something to you. I believe that for the church to operate the way that God wants, is it supposed to be multiplying? It's not supposed to be declining. It's not supposed to be subtraction or division. Here's what I mean by that. If I've had, let's say, five Pauls in my life invest in me, I need to be investing in at least 10 Timothys in my life. It, it is to me, it is just outright wrong if I let five people invest in me at Pauls in my life and I turn around and invest in one. I've just cost the kingdom. So I want to challenge you, like I said earlier, get some Pauls in your life, but now I want to challenge you, be a Paul to multiple Timothys. Here's what a Timothy is. A Timothy is a protege. Uh, a Timothy is somebody who's lifted up by you. It's somebody you intentionally invest in. It's someone you challenge. It's someone you seek to inspire. They should feel better about themselves and their abilities and what they're learning and the growth they see in themselves when they spend time with you. A Timothy should look better after spending time with you. They should be uh, more gracious as a spouse. They should be more gentle as a parent. They should be more uh, wise as a friend. They should be more dependent on God as a relationship, as a, a result of their relationship with you. So I want to ask you, do you have some Timothys in your life? Do you have some people that you can say, I intentionally pour into that person when I meet with them. I look for things to give them. I look for books that they would benefit from. I pray about conversations that I could have with them. Uh, about a month ago, there was a, a young family here, not young anymore, a family that was here that uh, I discipled him when he was in high school over 30 years ago. He has now been a missionary for years in the Philippines. He and his wife lead a Bible college. They lead an orphanage with uh, six homes on it. And then they uh, also lead a church planting organization and they're in the process of creating an organization that will send people from the Philippines to other parts of Asia. Now, I don't get to take credit for that, but I do get to just enjoy the fact that I'm watching a Timothy that is just amazing. So who are you watching that's amazing? Who are you looking at and going, man, I'll tell you what, everything I've invested in that person has been multiplied 10 times. Or are you sold on the American idea that your faith is an individual, private thing that you don't invest in anybody else? Um, I can tell you my wife is uh, in a car driving from Arizona out here to Minnesota. Uh, three or four long days of driving, guess who's in the passenger seat? One of her Timothys. And that Timothy was just saying, I want more time with you before you move. Is there, I'll go with you and fly back home. So Alana is not just driving with a friend out here. She is talking to a Timothy. And a Timothy is speaking to a Paul in their life. And they're mentoring and they're, they're laughing and they're sharing a trip together and they're ministering to each other. But both of them will be better for the time that they spent together. So I want to end real quick by just asking you like I did at the beginning. What do the people that you've surrounded yourself with, what did that say about who you're going to become? 
Are you, are you having intentional conversations, intentional relationships where your goal is for them to be better because they've spent time with you? Or are you just hanging out with them and it's just hanging out? I want to encourage you to make your life, live your life to the fullest, and be intentional about the conversation. Be intentional about the statement. Be intentional about the way you pray for them. Don't pray for life to go smoothly for them. Pray for life to be transformative for them. Sometimes I need something in my life to go wrong so I can learn something from it. But sometimes what we want to pray for is just that everything goes smoothly. So, I hope you have a, a Paul or two in your life. I hope you find some Barnabases in your life. And I want to challenge you to find some Timothys in your life. Let me pray about that, and then I'll share one more thing with you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, the Pauls in my life. God, I am a better person because of what they've taught me, what they've seen in me the way they've challenged me and uh, called me up. God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I benefit every day from the Barnabases in my life, and I pray that each one of us would surround ourselves with some Barnabases. Lord, I pray that we would find Timothys and we would invest in them and we would encourage them and we would uh, call them at the right moment and just be uh, an encourager to them. And Lord, I pray that all of these things will help us to speak the truth in love so that we can all become mature in faith the way that you desire for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at Anytime Beach, we have a couple of uh, young men uh, in their 20s that are going to be baptized. And so I just want to let you know that if that's where you're at, if that's the next decision in your life, if you're saying, look, I get it, I get that Jesus was God in the flesh, I get that he lived a sinless life, I understand that he died on the cross for my sins, and I'm willing, I'm ready to say, hey, my life is his, and I want to be baptized. If that's you, just say something to me on the way out. I'll give you the instructions or direction to Anytime Beach, and we would love to have you be a part of that tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Otherwise, if you want to see some real fireworks, come tomorrow night at 7 o'clock to Anytime Beach, and it'll far surpass anything you're going to see on July 4th. So amazing how the Holy Spirit works. See, last week... Sherry was telling me how she had just cleaned up some broken glass at her dad's house. And, and that got me thinking about how we look at things that become broken. You know, to many, broken things are looked at as just something worthless, something with no value, something that we would just toss away. I'm certainly glad that's not how God chose to to view me and my brokenness. If we give ourselves to God, he will take us in our brokenness and he will remake us into something better, into something new, something that he can use for his glory. Broken things and broken people are the result of sin. Yet God sent his son Jesus, who was without sin, to be broken so that we might be healed. As we meet around the table this morning, I'm reminded that on the night before he died, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. And he went all the way to Calvary to die so that we might live. His death Burial and resurrection has made it possible for broken, sinful humanity to be reconciled to God, to be healed. Without Jesus willingly going to the cross, we could not be made whole. We could not be made new. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he meaning Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us so much, for wanting to pick up the broken pieces of our lives, for sending your son to give us 
that chance to be reconciled, to be made right with you if we accept him. Father, these emblems are set before us, representing that broken body and shed blood. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what he did on the cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning and happy 4th of July. Uh, I'm really excited that you've chosen to come and be part of uh, our church service here this weekend as you're celebrating the 4th with your family and with your friends. If you're a guest here, just a special welcome. And, uh, and again, thank you for joining us and, and being here and making church a part of your plans this weekend. So I think that's really awesome. There's just one thing that I want everybody to know about is we've hit July. And at the end of July, uh, we have VBS coming. And so this is a fantastic opportunity for kids that are in elementary school to come and hang out for the week to hear about Jesus, to hear some stories from the Bible, and to, uh, to just really plant some new seeds for them. And so we're inviting you guys uh, as parents to get them signed up online um, on our website and help us get prepared for them by knowing what classrooms are we need and how many kids are going to be in each classroom. Um, we want your kids, but we want you to feel good about just going and inviting all the kids from your neighborhood to come as well. And so bring your car and make sure it's completely full of kids. <laughs> Sound like a good idea? Um, and then also, if you're looking, if you've got time and you can help us out with VBS during that week, uh, we would love your help in putting that on. And so there's lots of different areas that we need help in. If you are um, willing and able to be with us during VBS, we reach out to Leslie, and her contact information is on the website if you need that. But otherwise, she can let you know uh, where we need the most help at. So please do that. Uh, today, we're going to continue in our series, Cultivating a New You. And I just thought it was really appropriate that today's um, series would talk about the relationships that we have around us. And so um, as we're celebrating this holiday with our family or our friends, and we have time to rub shoulders and have conversations, uh, this is just a really um, uh, great time to be talking about the relationships that we have and how we're using those. So um, I'm looking forward to this and, and hearing from Tom again. But uh, let's go to God in prayer as we uh, dig into his word this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for all the love that you have uh, shown us through your son. And Father, how he rubbed shoulders with those around him and um, brought the disciples along with him. I, I thank you for sharing their stories and seeing how um, you continued to grow in them, how their faith continued to grow, and how they reached out to others around them. Father, help us to do the same thing, to live out our faith in a way that's meaningful to those around us. Help us to share our story um, with others and how Jesus has impacted our life. God, may we continue to grow in our own faith and that that would become um, just evident of who we are. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. 